why is the salt marsh important is a broad question that probably means different things to different people. For me, it has tremendous wildlife value. We have the Parker River Wildlife Refuge, which is part of the Great Marsh, and the importance of the migrating birds and the migratory bird waterfowl, the wading birds. It's also salt marsh sparrow. It's one of the last habitats for that, and it also backs up and keeps the coastal parts of Plum Island strong. They have a huge biodiversity, and a lot of that diversity is the food chain. Those little ditches, um, they lead up to bigger and bigger creatures and critters. They provide food and habitat for hundreds and hundreds of species. My name is Jeff Walker, and I've been a lot of things. The work with the Phragmites, which is probably the most important to me right now, we've been very strongly involved in it for the last 15 years. I'm involved with the Great Marsh Partnership. Peter Fippen and myself really started this years ago when we really saw what was going on in the Great Marsh. And now it's evolved. We've gotten the 2.9 Sandy Grant, um, $2.9 million, and we've also gotten $1.4 million from the National Fish and Wildlife. So, We've put a lot of money on the ground doing a lot of very good products to get rid of Phragmites, also to try to help save and make the Great Marsh a better place. My life's work has been to eradicate this plant. My name is Doug Packer and I'm the conservation agent for the town of Newbury. My position here uh, is more about the permitting end of the fight to Phragmites. So we try and do what we can to help uh, the Audubon Society, especially they have been a serious champion um, of this effort to pull pepperweed and to go after the Phragmites. Um, usually they come to the Conservation Commission. We do hold a hearing. Um, there's a couple different pieces of paperwork that we can use. Um, I'm sort of their, their last stop before they go out in the field and actually put it to application. Recreationally, tremendous beauty. People kayak, people boat, people fish. Economically, for the town of Newbyport and surrounding areas, this is a coastal plain, it's coastal barrier beach. Without our great marsh and its great views and its protections and its storm resiliency, this area would be forever changed. Phragmites australis is a tremendously invasive plant. It's a highly invasive plant that has no natural predation. And because of its tremendous height and how it grows, as you can see, so thickly, it shades out all your native vegetation and takes away the great marsh. It destroys the great marsh. It's a, it's a tall grass, uh, it's, a, it's a reed type grass. And uh, to be honest, I don't know how they originated here. It could have come in the holds of ships, it could have come in other products that were shipped. It creates a monoculture, and it creates a monoculture that in the first couple of years it doesn't get that robust. It might be three or four feet high, five feet high. But as it starts to grow and die, it creates a, a mat for itself. And this, this mat that it creates, it grows up through. And it, it's only about two or three seasons before this stuff is eight to 10 feet tall and even taller. And when you go to walk through it, the dead stuff is thigh high. Um, and it takes a Herculean effort to even walk through it. If you look down, there is absolutely no native vegetation. It drowns them right out. It just covers them. Uh, they, they can't compete with this grass. This grass is tall. It's extremely invasive. And it, and it makes its own type of root mass um, that gets it up above the marsh a little bit and gives it that brackish water that it loves. What does it do to native species? And it outcompetes it is probably the best thing to say. It takes away its light, it takes away its ability to spread. It also probably takes away all the nutrients and stuff that a native plant needs. Its biggest little source of spreading is all those little seeds. And in the old days, we used to think these seeds were not that viable. All these little seeds can be as high as 
15, 20, 25% viables. If they hit the right spot, they're gonna grow more Phragmites and cause more damage. They spread all year is my belief because they spread by rhizomes also. The rhizomes is the strongest way that they spread. Their seed years ago wasn't quite as viable as it is now, but it is becoming more and more viable the longer that the species stays around here. Phragmites is a very, very tough plant to control, certainly if it gets to the stage of this height. You can mow them, people think, it deters them. You can cover them with plastic. Some people have talked about pigs and goats, but really the most you know, effective way, and we start out with that and we hope to try to change the growing conditions, meaning we start out with herbicide, and we use herbicide as part of our team, the Great Marsh Partnership, to be able to keep this plant from taking the marsh completely over. This is so dense here in the places that we're spraying, we're usually targeting the Phragmite plant only, and whatever vegetation might get hit, because the Phragmites plant hopefully goes away, will become much stronger. There's a whole native bed of seed that's in these great marshes, and if we can get rid of this plant, the natural seed kind of comes through and it restores itself. There's multiple methods. Uh, most of it is going to be cutting and wicking or spraying and then cutting. Um, most of the time you'll find a, a type of marsh machine that has low ground pressure uh, and they'll go out with those machines and they put different uh, attachments on them to either mow it or flail it or, or to uh, spray a type of either rodeo or some product on it. What we would like to do ultimately is one of the reasons that Phragmites is so prevalent is especially back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we built our bridges which were once very wide for the sake of economy, we started to shrink them up and we produced tidal restrictions and those tidal restrictions stopped the salt water from getting into marshes like this because if you had good salt water coming into this area, Phragmites certainly don't like a high salinity or a very wet situation. So. If we could restore the natural flow of ocean water into this area, we would have much less frags. So right now we try to control them and we, until we can accomplish that task. I went out and I saw this plant. It was a little bit new to me, maybe 25, 30 years ago. And in those 30 years, we've seen this plant explode on our great marsh. If it continued unchecked, it would displace all our highly productive salt marshes, one of the most productive carbon sinks, fin fish, wildlife. The Great Marsh is one of the most spectacular places on earth and it would be all gone if we don't find a way to keep this plant in check. I have read an article saying that the Phragmite takes one heck of a beating and they're right, that fringe um, in a coastal onslaught and wave action may be beneficial, um, but I have not talked to anybody that took it as far as practice yet. There are certain people, especially recently, that have found some value in Phragmites. If it's bordering an upland area, such as a field or houses, it can provide storm resiliency during a storm. But for me, that's quickly offset by the fact that if it's bordering especially homes, this plant is tremendously flammable. I think that every plant out there has a place, um, but when one plant, when this in particular, starts to take over and become that monoculture and we lose that diversity, I, I think we've lost.